Building on the insights of his best-selling book, 52 Weeks with Jesus, Dr. James Merritt has written a brand new devotional to bring renewal to all who want more of Jesus. A great companion devotional or perfect on its own. Spend time with the one who changed everything. Get your copy of 52 Weeks with Jesus devotional from Touching Lives for $13 or get both books for just $20. Call 800-413-1131 or go to touchinglives.org. Today on Touching Lives. Don't you ever forget this as long as I live. This is true for Baptists, Methodists, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Pentecostal, Charismatic. This is true for everybody. The greatest miracle that Jesus Christ does today is the greatest miracle you'll ever do. It's not what He does to a man's body, it's what He does to a man's heart. Teaching people everywhere who Jesus is and why they need Him. This is Touching Lives with James Merritt. If I believe in Jesus, I must believe in miracles. You can't have it both ways. You can't say, I'm a follower of Christ, I believe in Jesus, I believe in the Christmas story, I believe in the Easter story, and yet not believe in miracles. Jesus was a miracle who worked miracles, and I believe still does. We're in a series we're beginning today that we're calling Supernatural. We're going to be studying miracles and some of the miracles Jesus performed over the next several weeks, because I think they are legitimate questions that ought to be answered. Did miracles really happen? Did Jesus really perform them? If He did, why did He perform them? And what relevance do they have in my life? Why are they even in the Bible? What's the point? How does the, how does the fact that Jesus performed a miracle 2,000 years ago help me to hack it on Monday morning? So we're going to be dealing with all of that. Now, believe it or not, if you're here this morning and you're a 21st century skeptic and you're saying, I can't believe you're an educated guy. You're up there telling me you believe in miracles. I'm going to tell you one of the reasons why I believe it, and that is because I'm going to show you what I think is a miracle that's about to happen right here in this room. I'm not, I'm not being funny. I'm going to show you what I believe is going to be a miracle that's going to happen right here in this room. I'm going to throw some verses up together that kind of form the basis of, of our whole series. In, in Matthew 15, if you have a copy of God's Word, you can turn to Matthew 15. And I'm going to read these verses out loud. But while I'm reading them out loud, either in your Bible or up on the screen, I want you to read these words with me, and I want you to watch a miracle take place. I'm going to begin. And great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and he healed them. So that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Now, I know you don't realize this, but you just witnessed a miracle in reading those verses. You say, what do you mean? Well, the simple act of reading those few words involve millions of impulses firing across billions of synapses in your brain. While you were sitting there reading those words, your heart went about its business circulating five quarts of blood through a hundred thousand miles of veins, arteries, and capillaries. Furthermore, it's amazing any of us could even concentrate on what we were reading, because while we were doing it, we're sitting on a planet that's traveling 7,000 miles an hour through space, spinning on its axis at a speed of a thousand miles per hour, and we're not even dizzy. <laughs> and you're telling me you don't believe in miracles? Listen, you'll get this in a moment. It is a miracle to me that anybody ever goes to sleep in one of my sermons. <laughs> it's just a miracle. I don't know how, I, don't, I just don't know how that could possibly happen. You know, I love me. But anyway, <laughs> as we think about miracles in general and the miracles of Jesus specifically, there's one thing I want you to keep in mind. It's very important. If you're out there and you're sitting there and you're saying, I just don't believe it. I, I don't believe in Jesus, the miracle worker. I believe he's a great teacher, great prophet, great this, great this. But I really don't believe he performed any miracles. I'm just not buying it. I just want you to think about one thing. It's, one of, it's a fascinating fact I never thought about before. Do you realize that the most vociferous and the most vocal enemies that Jesus had never contested the fact that he performed miracles? Not one of his enemies said, that really didn't happen. Not one of his miracles said, you didn't really do that. There was never a time when any of his, any of his enemies all denied one of his miracles. They, in fact, not only did they acknowledge it, here's what really got them ticked off. It was not that he did miracles. They didn't deny that. What ticked them off was how he did them and when he did them. So if you're sitting there saying, well, I don't believe in miracles, you don't even have them, you don't even believe, you're, you're not even where his enemies were. Even his enemies said, I saw them with my own eyes. I know that He did them. And the fact that Jesus was a miracle 
and perform miracles ought to teach us several things about miracles. And I'm just going to share those with you this morning. And all this is going to form a backdrop to what we're going to be doing over the next several weeks. All right, number one, I should believe in the possibility of miracles. I don't care if you're a science scientist. I don't care if you've got a PhD. I don't care if you're a nuclear engineer. I don't care if you believe in evolution. It makes no difference to me. You ought to believe in the possibility of miracles. And I want to tell you why. If you believe in a God worth believing in, you ought to believe in the possibility of miracles. You ought to believe in a miracle working God. Because let me just ask, be honest with you. What, what kind of a God is it that can't or doesn't work miracles? I mean, that God's not, to me, that God's not even worth worshiping if He can't do anything other than what we can do. But once you allow for the possibility, if you're one of the 96% of Americans who say, I do believe in God, I believe there's some supreme being, then you've at least got to believe that miracles are a possibility. Furthermore, if you're a genuine follower of Christ, you have to believe in the possibility of miracles because without miracles, you don't even have a Christianity. Christianity is a miracle faith. It is a faith of the miraculous. You can't even, listen, you can't even make sense of the Bible if you don't believe in miracles. If you believe in God, if you believe in Jesus, if you believe the Bible is basically a historically accurate document, you have to believe in the possibility of miracles. Until you understand the purpose of miracles, why they were even performed in the begin with, you will never understand the place of miracles. So I want to give you the three purposes that miracles fulfill. There are three reasons why you read about miracles in the Bible, and there are three specific reasons why Jesus performed miracles. And by the way, you're also going to understand now why miracles don't happen very often today. You're going to understand why miracles are a lot rarer today than they were in the New Testament. And you're also going to learn how do you distinguish between a true miracle worker and a false miracle worker, because believe it or not, the Bible says there are both. Purpose number one, the reason why miracles were done and the reason why Jesus did them is what I call authentication. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. When Jesus came, He was going to make some very bold claims. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. My, my theme verse, my life verse, John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Now, anybody can get up and make those statements, but if you make those statements, you better back it up. It's put up or shut up when you make those kind of statements. So Jesus said, okay, I've got to somehow, and he knew this, he knew how the human mind worked. He said, I've got to prove to you that what I'm telling you is true. As a matter of fact, one of the favorite terms that John uses in his gospel for miracles, he calls them signs. Now, you know what a sign is. A sign is something that points to something else or it points to someone else. And every time Jesus performed a miracle in the gospel of John, John said, now that's a sign. And what he meant by that was, this is a sign that Jesus is using to point to the fact that what he's saying is true and who he is, is God. Now, let me give you a great example. You may remember this story. There was a paralytic, and, and, and there were four buddies that wanted this paralytic to be healed. And they could not get into the house, and so they climbed up on the roof. Roofs back then were kind of thatched roofs. So they climbed up in the, on, on top of the roof, and they cut a hole in the roof, and they let this guy down so that Jesus would heal their buddy and make him able to walk. The interesting thing is when they get the man lowered, you know, you can, crowd's backing up. What's happening? Guy that's being lowered down on this, on this uh, pallet. And so they lower this man down. And the first thing, if you remember the story, the first thing Jesus says to this guy is, your sins are forgiven you. Which is easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven you or take up your bed and walk. Well, the easiest thing to say is your sins are forgiven you because nobody knows whether that happens or not. I could say to this whole crowd right now, hey, I don't care what y'all did last night. All your sins are forgiven you. Well, you don't know whether you're forgiven or not. You can't prove they are, can't prove they're not, okay? But if every one of you were in a wheelchair and I said, okay, get out of your wheelchair and walk, then we're going to know whether I got the goods or not, right? So Jesus said, well, which is easier to say? Well, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven you. And then Jesus said, oh, really? Okay, take up your bed and walk. The guy walks, walks out of the house. I mean, un, you know, unbelievable. Now, what was the point? The point was the miracle that Jesus performed that day wasn't healing the guy's legs. The miracle was he changed the guy's heart. The guy didn't just walk out. He walked out a different man. And so Jesus was just simply saying, so you'll know I can do what I say I can do, and I am who I say I am. Watch this miracle. So you, can't, you cannot separate the ministry and the message of Jesus from the miracles of Jesus. That leads to the second purpose. That's revelation. 
You know, one of the greatest miracles that Jesus ever performed, as you know, was exorcism. He was casting demons out of people. The reason I know that, did you know in the Old Testament you never read about one demon cast out of anybody? Never happens till Jesus comes. Now, why did Jesus perform exorcisms? Listen to this. On one occasion he said to the Pharisees in Matthew 12, verse 28, If it's by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Here's what Jesus was saying. I want you to watch what I'm about to do. Because if I can cast out demons out of this person right here, I'm going to prove two things to you. The kingdom of God has come, and the God of the kingdom has come. Now, the miracles of Jesus drove the Pharisees nuts. And here's why they would always get upset. Because every time Jesus, you know, would claim to be God in some way, shape, form, or fashion, He would do a miracle to prove it. And it eventually got Him crucified. As a matter of fact, it almost got Him killed before the cross. Because on one occasion, He was talking about how He was equal to God. And here's what He said in John 10, verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone Him. Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone Me? The Jews answered Him, it's not for a good work that we're going to stone you. In other words, do all the miracles you want to. We don't, that doesn't bother us. But for blasphemy. Because you are a man and you're making yourself God. Because Jesus had just said one verse earlier, I and the Father are one. And to any Jew that was blasphemy to claim that you were with, you were one with or equal to God. So the Pharisees pick up these stones. They say, buddy, we're going to rock your world. We're not going to put up with this. We're not going to listen to this anymore. Now listen to what Jesus says in the next verses. Look, if I'm not doing the works of my Father, then don't believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I'm in the Father. What Jesus said was, look guys, you've been watching me do all these miracles. If you don't want to believe what I say, at least believe what I'm doing. If you don't want to accept my words, at least accept my works. So Jesus performed miracles. Why? Authentication, revelation, third reason, glorification. Because everything that Jesus did, everything Jesus said, was to glorify His Father in heaven. You remember that paralytic that Jesus healed back in that story I told just a few minutes ago? After Jesus healed that guy, listen to what, how the crowds responded, Matthew 9, 8. When the crowd saw it, they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. Now you say, Pastor, you're really going deep today. Why, why, why do we need to know all this stuff? Well, let me tell you why. I'm going to address a subject just real briefly that most pastors never touch and most of you never heard before, and, and I just want to be real honest. This is why you need to understand the difference between miracles and magic. Big difference. Really big difference between miracles and what I call black magic. Between true miracle workers and false miracle workers. You say, you mean there are such things as false miracle workers? Absolutely. Jesus said at the end of time when we stand before Him, listen to what He's going to say, Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now watch what happens. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in Your name? Did we not cast out demons in Your name? And did we not do mighty works, i.e. miracles in Your name? Now watch what Jesus says. He doesn't say to them, no you didn't. Oh, they did. But I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now you talk about an eye-opener. Jesus says two things about miracles that you don't ever, ever forget this. Number one, a miracle is not always necessarily from God. You go back to the Old Testament. You remember when Moses stood before Pharaoh and he started doing all these miracles? Remember how what those magicians did? Did the same miracles. Miracles not always from God. Even if it's performed somebody, by somebody that calls Jesus Lord. Because, I listen, if you don't write anything else down, I'm saying this morning, write this one down. This, this is worth writing down. The message always trumps the miracle. The message always trumps the miracle. If somebody performs a miracle, but at the same time they're preaching or teaching things that are unbiblical, they don't line up with Jesus, they don't glorify God, they don't point to Christ as the Son of God, forget the miracle and forget the miracle worker. Forget them. Irrelevant. See, a miracle is not necessarily always from God. Number two, a miracle is not necessarily from God just because it helps people. 
I mean, these people did good things. They probably healed people. They casted out demons. I mean, if anybody, if you're married to somebody who's got a demon in them, you want that demon out, right? So that's a good thing. But even though it may be a good thing, it may not be from God. And these are people, when they stand before God, but we did good works. Yes, you did. We, we cast out demons. Yes, you did. We did miracles. Yes, you did. But I didn't know you. Now, when you put all this together, you'll understand why, that even though miracles are still possible, as you're going to see in a minute, they still happen. They're very rare, and they're very infrequent. And you say, well, why is that? Why don't we see miracles today like they saw 2,000 years ago? Well, now you're going to understand. Because two of those three purposes I gave you are no longer necessary. Jesus no longer needs to be authenticated. He no longer needs to reveal Himself. That's why we've got the Word of God. That's why we've got the Holy Spirit. But one thing that still needs to happen is, is that God needs to be glorified. And God's in the glory getting business. That's why I still expect God to do miracles because God always has been in the business of glorifying Himself. I, I don't tell this story often because I don't want you to get the wrong idea. And so I, I want you I want to be real careful how I tell you because I want you to hear every part of this story, okay? I have seen God do literal physical miracles. And I probably haven't told this story maybe in probably 25 years, because it happened about 27 years ago, 28 years ago this year. My former church, I, I went there in 1985. I'd been there about two months. And there's a man that, that, in fact, many of you in this church know this couple, and he had a daughter. She began to have pain behind her right eye. They took her to the finest doctors down at Emory University, and they discovered she had a tumor behind her right eye that needed to be removed. They told the mom and dad, look, we, we, we think we can get the tumor, but we're going to be very honest. She'll either lose her eyesight, most probably, or she may even lose the eye. We're going to do everything at least to save the eye, but there's a really great chance she's going to lose her eyesight. Well, the dad and mom called me and, and, and asked me if, if I would meet. This was on Saturday night. They called me, and they said, told me about the situation and said, you know, we've heard that, you know, people come to you, sometimes come to you and you'll anoint them with oil and lay hands on them, and you know we do that, people who ask us to do that. And so he said, would, would you be willing to do that tomorrow after church, and would you get some people together? And I said, be glad to do it. So after the 11 o'clock service, everybody had left, and it was me, the mom, dad, the little, the, their daughter, some of their family, and several deacons, and myself. We anointed her with oil. We laid our hands on her. We prayed for her. We cried out to God to heal, the, heal, you know, heal her, her eye. And, and I just said, Lord, even if, even if you don't you know, take her eyesight, at least be able to preserve the eye. Well, she used to have surgery early the next morning, and so they, they took her down to the hospital. And they're walking her down to the pre-op room. And while they're walking her down to the pre-op room, the dad, this idea comes into this dad's mind. He tells the people to stop. He goes to the hospital phone, calls the doctor. He says, I want you to do another CAT scan. And the doctor says, why do you want to do another CAT scan? And he said, well, we, we prayed for my daughter yesterday at church, and, and, and I'm just believing God for a miracle, and I want you to do one more CAT scan. And, and the doctor said, you know, Mr. Williams, I'm telling you, we've done two CAT scans already. You've seen both of them. There's no doubt the tumor is there. And it's really a waste of time and a waste of money. And the dad said, well, I'm not going to give you permission to do the surgery till you take her through the CAT scan. Well, about an hour or so later, the doctor comes out, white as a sheet, shaking like a leaf. He said, you know, I don't understand this, but we just can't find this tumor. He said, now, that's not what I came to tell you. He said, I want to do another CAT scan. And, you know, my friend said, you can do 100 CAT scans. I'm just telling you, you're not going to find that tumor. And he said, I'm telling you, there's a tumor in there. We're going to find it. He said, okay, I'll see you later. So he said, look, you know, they take him in there. This doctor gets two other doctors in there. They do this CAT scan. Two hours later, they come out. They call the family in. So the mom and dad and the daughter, he puts all four CAT scans up on the screen. He says, I'm going to be honest with you. I can't explain this. I don't understand this. You see the two CAT scans on the left. There is no question the tumor is there. You see the two CAT scans on the right. No question, the tumor is not there. I don't know what she ate. I don't know who you paid off. I don't know what you have done. I cannot explain it, but the tumors are gone. And this dad said, doctor, you don't get it. It's not what I did. It's not what you did. It's not what she did. It's what God did. Amen. Now, now, I want to wrap this up with a very shocking, surprising conclusion. See, we get real excited about hearing those kind of stories. And I don't have a lot of those. I'm not, I don't, I mean, this one will make sure. I am not 
a miracle worker. I want you to hear that plain and simple, okay? I don't believe in faith healers. I believe in faith healing. I don't believe in faith healers. People, if, if there's any faith healers out there, get to the hospital. Don't get in some kind of an, an arena and charge a lot of money. Just go to the hospital. Okay, that's what Jesus would do. And I'm not being critical. I'm just telling you. So, I, but I have seen God do this. But here, here's what I want you to understand. I'm, I'm just be honest with you. See, there's one other type of miracle I've left out of this message, and I purposely didn't tell you about it until I got to this part of the sermon as we wrap this up. Because there's still one other miracle that Jesus performed, one other type of miracle that Jesus performed that I think, I think is His greatest miracle and still His greatest miracle. And I think the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed in His life was not the physical miracles, it wasn't the natural miracles, it wasn't the supernatural miracles, it was the spiritual miracle. Now I'm going to show you something that I had never noticed before in all the times I'd read this passage of Scripture till I was studying for this message. That's one of the reasons why I love to read the Bible every day. One of the reasons why I'm convinced the Bible is the Word of God. Because it's the only book you can read every day, every week, every month, and every year, and you'll find something new almost all the time. And you'll go, I, where, how did I miss that? I never saw that before. It's incredible. So I, I'm reading this passage of Scripture when, when John the Baptist was in prison. And he starts having doubts. Did I make a mistake about Jesus? Because he was thinking about Jesus being one kind of a Messiah. And he's thinking, man, he's going to come back and the kingdom of God is going to come and the Roman Empire is going to be destroyed and the Jews are going to be lifted up again. And, you know, all's going to be right with the world. God is good. Go dogs. You know, the whole nine yards. And, 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 and it's not happening. So he sends his disciples to ask Jesus specifically this question in Matthew 11. Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? John said, I, I'm sorry, I know we're second cousins, but I'm just being honest with you. Man, I got second thoughts. I just want to make sure that you are who I thought you were. Now, I want you to listen to the answer of Jesus, and I want to show you something. You're not even going to get it. I promise you, most of you will, that I'd missed all of my life. Now, listen to his answer. And Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. Dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them. Jesus is talking about all these physical miracles. The blind see, the lame walk, lepers cleanse, deaf hear, dead are raised. And then he says, oh, and the poor have good news preached to them. You say, wait a minute. Whoa, back up. What is so miraculous about preaching good news? And why did Jesus put that last? I'll tell you why. Don't you ever forget this as long as I live. This is true for Baptists, Methodists, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Pentecostal, Charismatic. This is true for everybody. The greatest miracle that Jesus Christ does today is the greatest miracle you'll ever do. It's not what He does to a man's body. It's what He does to a man's heart. That's the greatest miracle of all. That is the unbelievable miracle. Now, let me tell you why this is so important. I want you to imagine we close this service and two things happen in this service. I want you to imagine that someone on their own begins to run their wheelchair down here. They're paralyzed. They were born from birth paralyzed. And I want you to imagine they wheel down here and they say, Pastor Merritt, would you pray for me, God, for God to heal me? And I lay hands on that man, and that man gets up out of his wheelchair and starts running around this, this auditorium. I want you to imagine somebody came down at the end of the service, and they were born blind. And they said, Pastor Merritt, would you pray for me? And I pray for them, and all of a sudden, they've got 20-20 vision. And then I want you to imagine that one other person comes down here and just simply says, look, I'm lost. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Can you tell me how I can get right with God? And I just share a simple message. Yes, God loved you so much He sent Jesus to die on the cross and paid for your sins and He came back from the dead so He could live in your heart. And if you'll place your faith and trust in Him, He will save you and forgive you and give you eternal life. And He just does a simple thing. Lord Jesus, would you just come into my heart and save me? Now let's just be honest. When you went back out the door and started telling your friends what happened at church today, you know what you'd be talking about? You'd be talking about the guy that got up and walked. You'd be saying, "You man, you missed it. You'd be calling, those, you'd be calling you know, some of your buddies that you know, slept in this morning. You'd be calling them up. Boy, you missed it today. Man, this guy was blind as a bat. Couldn't see anything. And the pastor prayed for him and walked out with 20-20 vision. You missed a miracle. <laughs> and all the time, God would be looking at all of us and saying, you missed it. It wasn't a miracle. That wasn't the real miracle. Let me tell you why. 
When you compare those two miracles, there's no comparison. One is temporary. Because even if those people are healed, they're still going to die. One is permanent, eternal, because that person's going to live forever. Amen. The physical miracle, that only takes a touch from the little finger of God. The spiritual miracle cost God His only Son. But we missed it. We walk out of here, I just don't believe God performs miracles. Every time we baptize people in that baptistry, you're looking at a miracle. Every time somebody, a little nine-year-old boy says, I want to give my life to Jesus, you're looking at a miracle. That's why every time somebody comes up to me back in the, back, back in the lobby and says, hey, today I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. Every time I see someone baptized in our church, every time I see a life changed by the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that He died for our sins, was buried, and raised from the dead, that's why every time I see that happen, when you ask me the question, hey, pastor, do you believe in miracles? My answer is yes, because I see it in the hearts of changed people. The very first miracle that a born-again believer encounters is that of a changed heart and a future that is destined for heaven. If you haven't yet asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, call us today. We want to pray with you to receive your very first taste of the miraculous love of Jesus. Call Touching Lives at 800-413-1131. Building on the insights of his best-selling book, 52 Weeks with Jesus, Dr. James Merritt has written a brand new devotional to bring renewal to all who want more of Jesus, a great companion devotional or perfect on its own. Spend time with the one who changed everything. Get your copy of 52 Weeks with Jesus devotional from Touching Lives for $13 or get both books for just $20. Call 800-413-1131 or go to touchinglives.org. With each person who hears the message of Christ and chooses Him as Savior and Lord, a miracle occurs. And because of the faith-filled prayers and the generous financial support of our donors, the Ministry of Touching Lives continues to share that miraculous, life-giving message of Jesus around the globe. Thank you for your support.